Welcome to CK Sports Talk on 99.1 CKXS. CK Sports Talk is brought to you in part by Canada Business Services, the Chatham-Kent Sports Network, and 99.1 CKXS. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to CK Sports Talk here on the Mighty XS. That's 99.1 on your radio dial. My name is Peter Cobb, and yes, sitting across from me, you know him as the wizard from Wallaceburg. He is Mr. Sean Patrick Moynihan. Our producer, Mr. Corey North, who always had south to Ridgetown, that is, is somewhere in the studio. Normally, he, Mr. Moynihan, he's got a bag of chips on the go or something. but uh, Doritos, pretzels. Yeah. Yes, yeah. well, um, Corey North's on fire tonight, too. He's in tremendous mood. It's, it's uh, Christmas season for Corey, and... He just loves December here in the radio station. They're super busy, and he's our man uh, getting everything ready for us, Pete, and setting up um, all the technology for our interviews, et cetera. The great Corey North. And he does a ton. Like when we do our hockey broadcast, saw a great game last night in Blenheim, uh, Jay Smith and I did, and he's the guy back here in the studio who does the in-between period stuff, the out-of-town scoreboard and such. And and a challenge to manage because you're kind of on a phone line on a remote. but. Uh, tell us about that hockey game. I know you were in uh, Blenheim last night, you which know, is sort of an interesting connection to our guests we're going to talk to a little later tonight, Pete. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I had a real nice chat with Paul Bortnio, who was the head coach of the Addies. And uh, we developed quite a relationship with that team because Blenheim played Amherstburg last year in the playoffs and the semifinals. And it was a six-game thriller. Uh, both teams, the Addies eventually won. Then they took on the 73s and lost in seven. It was an right. exhausting series, he said. And Paul believes, and I think he's right, that that series, you know, Essex left and then went and played Air, and Air beat them, AYR beat them four straight. And uh, he felt that the starch was taken out of them in that uh, Essex 73 Admiral series. Well, a lot of people felt it was a coming out party for Amherstburg and that they had – Hey, we're here. We're, we're making our mark in this league. And you see it this year. Uh, Essex, I believe, has jumped into first place. They're a real juggernaut, as you know. Uh, Lakeshore has come from nowhere, and they're to be reckoned with this year. Amherstburg, Blenheim. And, you know, we're going to talk with Bill Saunders a little later, who we now are. does some work for the Blades. And he had some interesting uh, perceptions on how the league is going to unfold. But we've said it a million times, and we're accurate, of course. Um, junior C, near the end of the season, come playoff time, just look out, Scout, because it will be, it'll be incredible. Yeah, without a doubt. And he, um, you know, he was so kind and gracious to us. Uh, we went to his home uh, and uh, did the interview, and, uh, boy, he was a wealth of information. He, and he has had some experiences oh. that I'm, I'm so envious. But, Pete, just a couple of other things as we uh, get ready for our special guest tonight. Um, not, I'm, I have to admit, I'm not the greatest soccer fan. You know my theory, how come a sport with such big nets has such low scoring? It doesn't really work for me all the time. <laughs> but uh, kudos to Toronto FC. Um, in the championship game on that Saturday, seven o'clock at night, Toronto will be, you know, um, Toronto soccer fans will be crazy for that MLS Cup, and um, you know, c- congratulations to Toronto FC. We watched the uh, the semifinal game against the Montreal Impact, and it was tied in aggregates. They were both tied five right. five. Went into extra time, and Toronto it's, it's raining like to to beat the band. Toronto scores two goals. The place, they could hear the noise all the way to Hamilton. I know they could. That stadium's right down on the lake. They have a tremendous following. You remember the great Zach Lawton who worked for TV Koji Cole? Absolutely. Well, he's a huge FC fan, and he was tweeting out, you know, how excited he was. They're going to take on the Seattle Sounders for the whole ball of wax. And you know, Sean, that Toronto FC, this is 10 years in the yeah, making. Yeah, I was surprised club. to hear that. I didn't think, I, I would have guessed maybe half of that. But, uh, well, we know there's many diehard soccer fans, you know, here in Chatham-Kent, here in mm-hmm. Wallsburg. So go get them, uh, Toronto FC. Pete, last week we had a little bit of a hockey show. I enjoyed <laughs> it. Um, and I'm looking at the standings and, oh, my. I mean, there are so many 
teams around the 500 mark. Um, and we, we had some, some guesses. We, you know, who do we think uh, was going to be the dark horse this year come playoff time? There's always someone that sneaks into the playoffs. And, you know, we had some good, uh, had some interesting selections. The great Grace Cunha went with the Red Wings. <laughs> Chris Taylor said the LA Kings. Lee here at the station liked the Columbus Blue Jackets, and they have been a surprise this year. Pete, you like the Minnesota Wild. And uh, they have had great goaltending thus far. Um, I went with Ottawa um, basically because uh, no Canadian team made the playoffs last year. And I'm, I'm something in my heart, I'm just pulling for the Ottawa Senators. But, you know, we did not talk a whole ton about the Calgary Flames. And, of course, we've had T.J. Brody right here on the show who was – just a first-class gentleman and one yeah, of the great interviews we've done. We're going to re-air that on the uh, in January again just for our listening audience. So we'll give the date in the future, but we're going to re-air that T.J. Brody interview in January. But I felt kind of bad after we were finished the show and you and I were debriefing after the show. <laughs> we didn't talk enough about the Calgary Flames. They had the worst goals against last year in the NHL. They made goaltending changes this summer. They started slow. Um, I, I, I said, how can this team be so poor right off the bat? Johnny Goodrow, Sean Monahan, TJ Brody. Um, they got some fine players. Well, Pete, they have won three in a row. They really, it really looks like they've righted the ship. They're uh, an even 500 right now, 13, 13, and two. Well, Johnny Hockey had a broken finger and missed a, a bunch of games, but he came back like a house of fire. I think he had two goals last night, didn't he? he or he, he scored did, well, last night. Well, they won 8-3. Yeah. It was their best night of the year, everyone has said. And, um, you know, they're, they're sitting, I think they have 28 points right now. And in first place in their division, that Pacific division, is San Jose. And San Jose has 31 points. Uh, so does Edmonton, ironically, 31 points. So that division is really up for grabs. And I'm really hoping we're going to talk more about T.J. Brody and, and a run the Calgary Flames are going to make because two years ago they had that tremendous playoff run, upset Vancouver in the first round. Uh, the world was on fire about the Calgary Flames, and I just hope we see that happen again this year. I think you're right, and uh, you know, I want to give his mom and dad a shout out. We saw them. You and I ran into them at the uh, dance that the Junior Kings held with the O'Hare brothers there, right. uh, uh, a, f a week and a half ago or so, well, and it was good to see them. Lots of Calgary Flames around, and Pete, you know, your Toronto Maple Leafs. Um, I see on placed on waivers today their backup go goalie, uh, Enroth. Um, now he's lost all four starts. And, well, they lost to the Calgary Flames the other night, 3 nothing, and he let in two goals, I think, in a, like a two-minute span there. Yeah, right at the start of the game. Even though both goals, Pete, were kind of seeing-eye goals, yeah. you know, just tips and deflections, etc. But, boy, I see Toronto will be looking for another goalie, and does that mean someone from the Marlies? comes up it's going to be interesting well they had an issue if you remember with Garrett Sparks uh, and they an suspended him one. but Garrett Sparks is back uh, they did a real nice interview with the young kid he's back with the with the Marlies and I wonder whether he's going to get the call up well they've had someone in camp practicing with them ironically I think he's one of the guys that actually played a lot with Calgary last year and I apologize to our listeners I can't think of his name right now is it Romy or something like that? Uh, Anyways, yeah. he was out with a knee injury for a lot last year. He's tr he's trained with Toronto. Kind of a rumor that maybe they're going to bring him back because um, you like some experience there. But, Pete, you know, I know it's not baseball season right now, but listeners, Major League Baseball winter meetings are going on as we speak in Washington, D.C. And this is a time where we normally see – a ton of movement uh, in Major League Baseball. And Pete, there seems to be just a ton of big names up for sale or going to be uh, acquired by other ball teams. Did you see where they felt that Encarnacion, who's one of those big names that is going to go somewhere, and we all thought he's going to go to the Red Sox. That doesn't look like it's going to happen now. Um, Maybe does he head to uh, well to New York? I, I don't you know, know. Toronto fans need this to say, and I uh, I had a chance to visit with both of my brothers from Toronto this weekend, and in fact, one of my brothers has already presented me with 
a pair of Toronto Blue Jay socks. Like, I'm not sure where I would wear them, Pete. But anyways. I would uh, check the oil and the, uh, the link in your driver. Absolutely. Those, okay? I'll yeah. use them to <laughs> buff the car with. Good call. But Edwin was offered a four-year deal with the Blue Jays, supposedly for $80 million. He turned that down, and now there's a bit of a discussion. Will that be matched out there? And they're just not sure. But it would be interesting to see where Edwin goes because Toronto has made a couple moves as if yes. they're planning for a future without him. But a big one will be Chris Sale of the White Sox. Oh, yeah. Tremendous left-handed pitcher. The buzz there is the Nationals. Another hot buzz right now, Andrew McCutcheon of the Pittsburgh oh, what Pirates. what a dynamite player. Boy, I'd love to see him roam center field for our Tigers. Well, he's uh, he had a down year this past year. He is 30 years old. Boy, supposedly the Nationals are also interested in him. Uh, possibly the Dodgers. But the one interesting piece for me is our Tiger right oh fielder, my. J.D. Martinez. And the talk is that he's, his contract is coming up, that the Tigers will likely will not pay big money in long term. Where will he go? And, you know, I had a bad dream last night oh that man. actually Toronto traded for him. Oh. And I, I wouldn't that would really – confuse me and my loyalties if J.D. Martinez became a Blue Jay. Um, the talk there might be the Giants uh, or possibly the Mets. But um, interesting time right now in Major League Baseball. And you will see late today, there's even been some moves today. Next couple of days, I'm pretty confident you're going to see some um, interesting things. And Pete, just before we go to break, I think we mentioned it a couple of weeks ago. Bridget Carlton and the Iowa oh State Cyclones are off to a tremendous <laughs> start, 6-1. and one, And we were all excited about that big match. Uh, I think they were sixth in the country. The Mississippi, Mississippi State. State Bulldogs were in, and we, we were very anxious to see the outcome of that game because that was going to be a tremendous test for Iowa State and Bridget. And, Pete, tough loss in overtime. Um Tied 71-71, by the way, at the end of regulation. Iowa State had a 17-point lead. In fact, our own Bridget Carlton from Chatham, Ontario, future Olympian, hit a three-bucket to really give them a 17-point lead and seemed to be in control. However, they lost that game in OT to the nationally ranked Um Mississippi State Bulldogs. You know, and the Bulldogs had not lost to a non-conference opponent in like about six or seven years, so it looked like the upset was was, was going to take place. Taking. But that's those good teams seem to find a way to win. And like you said, it went into overtime, and that would be a stinging loss for that team. But um, they'll bounce back. They've got a good club, and uh, I like their chances. And if they make that uh, 64 uh, team, wherever they are, you and I are jumping on a plane. Well, and, that uh, Big 12 is great basketball. Oh, and Iowa State, huge crowds there for, for men's and women's basketball. And, of course, we're, we're keeping an eye on Bridget because um, ultimately we're, we're hoping she makes that Canadian Olympic team in the future. Pete, we better take a break, and when we come back, everyone, we have a tremendous interview for you tonight with the legendary Bill Saunders. We'll be right back. Because local does matter. This is CK Sports Talk on 99.1 CKXS. All right, welcome back. CK Sports Talk. Peter Cobb here, the wizard from Wallsburg, Mr. Sean Patrick Moynihan and Mr. Moynihan, and you and I had the real uh, honor and pleasure of heading out to the Golden Acres uh, and uh, visiting with the director of player personnel, Mr. Bill Saunders. But, it, we, you know, we didn't talk a lot about hockey. We talked a lot about his Well, profession. what a career. Of course, um, he started in Chatham in 1967 with the Chatham Daily News, was a sports reporter. And what uh, some tremendous experiences he's had. I, I'm envious. He's been to a number of World Series and other events. Pete, let's hear from Bill Saunders. Okay, folks, we are here in the heart of the Golden Acres in the house of a man that was born and raised in Dutton, Ontario. I speak none other than uh, the great Bill Saunders, who was a legend uh, sports editor, uh, amongst other jobs at the uh, Chatham News. 
uh, Mr. Moynihan and I are here in the kitchen uh, enjoying a, a chat. And Bill, I guess, uh, first of all, thank you for joining us here on CK Sports Talk. Yeah, no problem. And uh, Bill, I guess um, for our listening audience, what are you doing today? What's your job today? And what does a typical day look like for you? Well, I've uh, since I retired, actually even before I retired, my stepson started to play for the Blades in 97, and uh, Tim Cox was the coach for that one year, and then Sean Tiffin came in the next year. Sean had worked at the Chatham News briefly, and I knew him pretty well, and one night he uh, said, hey, can you do some stats, and it just went from there, and uh, I've been general manager, I'm secretary, uh, director of hockey operations. Uh, player personnel now, which doesn't really mean much. Mostly I sell advertising, which is what I should have done in my first career, maybe. Uh, it's a lot of money to put a junior hockey team on the ice. We're about 120 grand, and I work from the 1st of May, uh, and I'm still collecting stuff in now, and we put out a nice program. You guys have probably seen it, and uh, so that's what I do. And along with general manager Wayne Cowell, who was the best move I ever made with a phone call. Um, uh, we work, and Matt Frayne, our president, we work pretty close together. But it's a lot of work. Like when I was working at the paper, I just shut my office door. <laughs> <laughs> You're on and call now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bill, you had a really a legendary career with the Chatham Daily News. I know you started in 1967. Uh, I mentioned earlier how you retired in 2005. Uh, tell us about the various roles. I know you were a sports writer when you started. Tell us about the various roles you served with the Chatham Daily News and how those uh, different positions evolved. Well, when I graduated from college, I went to Port Huron Junior College. I think it's called St. Clair Community College now uh, for, for two years. Uh, they were looking for students because the Vietnam War was on, and a lot of Canadians were there wow. at the time. And I went for, for two years and graduated, and uh, my high school basketball coach, uh, phys ed coach, had retired, and he was selling Sun Life in Chatham. And so he got me a job, and I graduated on a Friday night, and I started on Monday with Sun Life. And that went through the summer, and then one day, and I was doing okay too, but one day I saw an ad in the Chatham News that they needed a sports writer. So I thought, what the heck? So I went up, Doug Waite was the managing editor at the time, and he hired me on the spot, September 15th, I guess, of 67, uh, and I became a sports writer there. And then I became, a year later, I became sports editor uh, because our sports editor, Ren Davis, moved on to the Winnipeg Free Press. And I stayed there in sports until 1980, and we had three kids, and city editor paid more than sports editor. <laughs> so I went to this city editor's job, and then over the years it evolved as, as assistant managing editor and then managing editor when I retired. It was a great job. I don't think there was more than one or two days in 37 and a half years that I didn't want to go to work. Could hardly wait most. We had so much fun, it's, if people only knew. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. And Bill, tell me about covering sports back in the late 60s and early 70s in Chatham, Kent. What were the real hot sports? What did people really follow? What did you spend a lot of time covering back then? Well, obviously the Maroons. Uh, we went on the road, myself and the person that was working for me, or when I was working for Ren Davis, we went to all the road games, and uh, they were the, the number one sport. Fergie Jenkins, of course, was also number one, but of course he wasn't in, in Chatham. He was, and then Bill Atkinson came along. It was kind of amazing. They lived across the street from each other on Adelaide in uh, Chatham, and they both made the major leagues as pitchers. Uh, minor baseball was huge, uh, and high school sports was always huge. You know, it, it, just a ton of sports in, in Chatham. But the Maroons were, as far as traveling and that kind of stuff, uh, they had some good teams some of those years. They won a Outlaw League uh, Junior A title, and then they won the Southern Ontario Junior A title, and several guys off those teams went on to the NHL. Ken Houston being the best known, but Vern Stenlund and, and a bunch of others as well. They had 3,000 people in there on a Tuesday afternoon, game eight, against the Guelph Imperials uh, in 1973. It was an eight-point series. They each had seven. 
and the skating club wouldn't give up the ice at night. So they played the game at two o'clock in the afternoon. A lot of people didn't make work that day, <laughs> and they won. So uh, that's a great story. Yeah. And Bill, you mentioned to us already a few of the um, tremendous athletes that you, you covered while doing sports. But who are some of the other characters and some of the key figures you had the pleasure of covering over your career? Oh, George Aiken, of course, uh, oh. the coach of the, the Maroons. He, he was coach when I started. Uh, I wouldn't say that I covered him, but Dave Hodge who had worked in the Chatham News as Dave Hodginson. And, really? Yeah, that's his actual wow. name, and then moved to CFCO, and uh, I came and took his job. It was his job that I, that I took. Uh, he is a character and a great friend, um, and they're just all kinds of guys, like uh, Kenny Houston, obviously, right? And, and Larry Leahy and Mort Giles, who I went to high school with, uh, he's the guy that got volleyball going. Brian Fluker, who I played at West Elgin with, uh, you know, just to name name a few. And uh, and and then I had a uh, quite an experience with Ernie Harwell. Uh, I was the Hall of Fame broadcaster, of course. I was down and uh, covering a game. I'd go down, just call up Hal Middlesworth, and he'd say, "Sure, come on down. We got passes for you, and you need seats for your kids." And it, it was amazing. But anyway, they have a, a tiger room at that day, that time, and you'd go in, and they had all kinds of free food for the reporters and the TV guys and whoever was there. And so I'm sitting there one day at a table of eight all by myself. I just sat down, and along comes Ernie Harwell. So he says, you mind if I sit here? And of course not. <laughs> and he introduced himself as if he had to, like I knew who he was. And he said, uh, um, where are you from? And I said, well, I'm from Chatham. I'm with the Chatham Daily News. And he said, oh, Chatham. He says, Jesus, my wife and I love Chatham. He said, we go down there and stay at the Holiday Inn three or four times a year. He said, it's beautiful on the river. And he said, and we always like to go to that Italian restaurant. He said, out, out on the highway. Well, what's the name of that place again? I said, Rosini's. Rosini's yeah. He said, that's it, Rosini's. So anyway, we ate, and every time I saw him after, he could never remember my name, but he always called me Chatham. <laughs> How are you doing, Chatham? And Dougie Melvin, of course, uh, who, as sports fans know, had quite a baseball career off the field. Right. Um, right. He was with the Yankees. Uh, George Steinbrenner liked him. Even He didn't make it as a pitcher, but he hired him to do stats. And whenever the Yankees were in, I would go down, and uh, uh, we would sit together up in the press box at the top of the, uh, the stadium. And you know, it was always good to see him. And what a great guy, you know. I mean, just an amazing career he's had. And that's at the old Tiger Stadium. And the that press Tigers, box was on the roof. And you were exposed yes, to the Yes, it was. <laughs> I'll tell you, it was for sure. And uh, it burnt. I don't know if you remember that or not. There was a fire in the press box. Uh, it was in the winter. It, it, there was nothing going on, but something caught fire. And uh, so anyway, uh, there was stories in the Detroit paper about the fire and that the biggest concern was Jim Hawkins' locker. Jim Hawkins was a sports writer for the Detroit Free Press. And of course, nobody could figure out why Jim Hawkins' locker would be a concern. But he had a lot of magazines in that locker. <laughs> That's when things got slow on the field, he'd pass them around. He, he was a character, too. Well, those are some great characters that you met in your travels. All right, folks. Welcome back. Boy, that isn't, aren't those stories just fantastic? Well, I love the Ernie, Har Ernie Harwell story. You know, we've heard so much about Ernie Harwell. And, Pete, you and I have had the pleasure of being down at, at Comerica Park in the press box. Uh, we don't want to mention anyone again. We were on the field for opening day. <laughs> People are tired of hearing that story. We're still pinching ourselves. But, you know, the great Dan Dickerson, the voice of the Detroit Tigers, who was on our show one night, you know, he also told tremendous stories about the generosity and kindness of um, Ernie Harwell. And uh, what a great throw out to Rosini's. Yeah, uh, I hope incredible? the good people from Rosini's are listening tonight because that's good to know that Ernie Har Harwell, legendary Hall of Famer announcer, very popular in Detroit, 
like to eat at Rosini's. Everyone, we're going to take a short break, and we're going to be back to hear about uh, the great Bill Saunders and his stories from Chatham Kent Sports. Welcome back to CK Sports Talk with 991 CKXS. To submit your local sports news, info, or score, email news at ckxsfm.com. All right, welcome back, folks. Okay, well, we heard part one of our interview with Bill Saunders. Uh, let's tune in and listen to part two. Um, Bill, I'm amazed at some of the great sporting events uh, you've had a, an opportunity to cover. Uh, Pete and I are very jealous. <laughs> but uh, uh, talk to all our listeners about some of the different sporting events that you traveled to and you covered. I know for a fact uh, you covered the three home games of the 1968 World Series. And um, as big Tiger fans, so envious. Tell us about some of those unique events that you um, you covered. Yeah, that was the uh, the first one. I I'd been hired as a as I said as just a writer, but in mid September of '68, Ren Davis, who's from Winnipeg, uh, he had applied for the Winnipeg Free Press, and um, so he he got the job, right? And uh, so I was going to become sports editor, but he was still there till the end of, of September, and he had applied for World Series credentials, but they had him switch it to the Winnipeg Free Press. So now Chad News ones were there. So he called down and he got all the names changed and you know I got I got my credentials and went to those three games. And that was really something. And by going to the game, I mean you go right in the dressing room and, and everything. It was it was pretty amazing, you know. And of course Tigers lost three of the first four and then came back and, and won it in St. Louis. Now the Chatham News didn't have the money to send me to St. Louis, but Ren won the Winnipeg Free Press. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well I have at home on my uh, on my special bar downstairs a beautiful autographed Mickey Lolich. 1968 World Series champs baseball that a good friend gave me as a retirement <laughs> gift. So I, I have a real, real soft spot for that 1968 that team. That was quite a team. Uh, what were some of the other great events that you had a chance to, to well, go down Well, in 71, I covered the, uh, the All-Star game, uh, the one where Reggie hit the... Uh, yeah, that light the, tower. The light yeah. tower, yeah. And uh, being not very bright, I didn't think to get autographs because I was in the dressing room and on the field, both games before the games, and all those guys were there, right? Oh Bench my goodness. And Clemente, and Fergie, of course, and Billy Williams, and, and Kaline, and Killebrew, and all those great, great players, and I didn't get any of them. But Fergie took me around and introduced me to all the guys in the National League dressing room, and that, that was pretty neat. And he pitched in that game. Uh, a little bit as well. Right. And then in uh, 72, I covered the uh, American League Championship Series with the Oakland A's and the Tigers lost in, in five games. You invite uh, a blue on that. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oakland Reggie A's Jackson and, and you Sal know, Bando. Got, Sal <laughs> Bando, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Billy Martin was the, the Tiger manager. And also, uh, or in 71, I covered the Canadian Open in. Uh, uh, golf tournament in London at the Hunt Club that Kermit Zarley won. Bob Hope called him the golfer from the moon. Okay. <laughs> and in 72, the PGA was at Oakland Hills. Oakland Hills, right? Yeah. And then in 76, the Canadian Open was at, at Essex and uh, Essex Golf and Country Club in Windsor. Uh, those were big. That, you know, I remember I, I was telling Peter the other day we were talking about something that uh, Gary Player, uh, Arnold Palmer, and Jack Nicklaus were the big three. But Lee Trevino had just kind of come out of nowhere and had won a couple of major events. So after the Saturday round, Player was in contention. And so they have this big room where all the media goes in for interviews. So Player comes in, and Dan Ewall, uh, who later worked for the Tigers, Tigers yeah. he was uh, the... Uh, guy with the free press or news in Detroit and the very first question he asked was to Gary he says what's it like to maybe not be part of the big three anymore Wow. Gary Player looked at him and he said I think it's the big four <laughs> and he got up and left oh wow that was the end of the interview and there's a whole mess of sports guys sitting there 
looking at Dan Ewall, like, could have asked that question last. Yeah, that's right. We just and lost yeah. our And interview. he won the next day. Player won it oh. on a Sunday, yeah. The Black Knight. The yeah. Black Knight. He was a very small man. Really? Yeah, very small. You'd be surprised if you saw him. Okay, Bill, I, I find it interesting, back in the day when you, when you started with the news and covered a lot of sports, uh, you were writing a column every day except Monday. You know, today, and uh, Pete and I have talked about it before on the show, you know, really, there's not anyone who writes anymore. No one really expresses an opinion or an idea. It's mostly just reporting scores. Well, what's your perception on how writing has really changed in print media today? It's amazing. It's so sad, actually, for any of us that grew up reading the newspaper, or in my case, working for it and writing, the papers, there's just nothing in them anymore. You'll see on the front page of the Chatham News, there's a picture that's eight columns wide and seven inches deep. People probably wonder why that is. Well, the reason is they don't have any news to, to put in it. Right. The staff is small. Yeah. Uh, when, I worked, when I first worked there, we had two in sports, uh, a woman's editor, and one, two, three, six reporters. I think they're down to about three reporters now, and they do everything. And it's not just the Chatham News, it's all of them, you know. Um, every, a lot of stuff is just pulled off the wire. We had 36, 40-page papers on Wednesdays. That was grocery ad day in those days, and so uh, A&P and the various grocery stores would take double-page ads, and that eventually went away with the flyers, you know, and everything works off advertising. If you don't have advertising, you don't have you don't have a paper. And now with the internet and all the things that go with it, I, I don't know where it's going. I'd be surprised if we have a local paper within three or four years, except for papers like the Blenheim. I was going to say the smaller communities. Smaller communities they will do maintain well. that. They yeah, because been. they give you local news, right? Yeah. I mean, you can't read that anywhere else. You're not going to hear it much on the radio anymore. Radio, as you guys know, has changed so much to what it used to be. And uh, I don't say it's for the better, that's for sure. But uh, the newspaper industry, uh, it's, it's in deep trouble. I don't know what the circulation is now, but it was 15,000 when I left in uh, 2005. Right. It might not be half that now. Well, it's just unfortunate. You really have to go to um, Sports Talk Radio, um, really, to get an opinion on on a trade, on any development, on a play, on a call. And I know back in the day when you uh, wrote your column, you had many interesting opinions. And, uh, of course, people really enjoyed reading that. Okay, everyone, as we wrap up with um, legendary newspaper man Bill Saunders. Bill, why don't you tell all our listeners, um, who are your favorites? Who do you follow? What are your teams? I follow all the Detroit teams. I grew up a Tiger fan. My parents, uh, my dad and his brother had a lumber business in Dutton, and they'd pull me out of school around noon on a Friday, and we'd go down to Detroit, and we'd stay at the Tuller or the Statler Hotel downtown, and we'd go to Friday night game, Saturday game, Sunday, usually uh -huh. double header, and then we'd come home. We'd do that probably four times a, a summer. And of course, the Red Wings with Cordy Howe, who I actually, I forgot to mention that. I actually got to know him and become friends with him and his wife, Colleen. Very good friends, actually. And um, and the, the Lions, of all, all the Detroit teams. And my dad was the same way. So they sometimes... You either go one way or the other, yeah, right? Either. Sure. Well, yeah. you're, you're a smart man, Bill Saunders, <laughs> going all with the Detroit teams. You know I love that. <laughs> Let's uh, throw a couple questions out at you for real quick answers. Will the Toronto Maple Leafs make the playoffs this year? Well, you know what? I'm not a Leafs fan. I never have been, but I hope so. I think it would be good for hockey. Uh, they've got all those young guys. When it gets going down the stretch there after the first of the year, it might get tough. They might be a couple of years away yet. But That's what I think. It would be nice to see them at least get in, you know, for the interest around here. Yeah, I, I disagree with you. I hope they don't. <laughs> but, uh, what about the Red Wings? I you know there's a yes. lot of talk. I feel the Red Wings just don't seem to have um, enough scoring myself. No, they don't. But, uh, do you think they'll make the playoffs this year? Gee, Bill? I don't know. It's Once again, look at the standings. It's all so close. They got a point last night, but they only got one goal. You're not going to go out and trade for... And that's like on they, home ice. They're not winning a lot no, on home ice. Uh, it's not like when they had the trade deadline and they picked up all kinds sure. of guys. I would think of this might be the year that they don't make the playoffs. Yeah. And, and that's okay. If only once in a quarter of a century. <laughs> that's right. What about the Detroit Tigers? Rumor has it they're going to dump some salaries and clean house.
House, uh, Kinsler, J.D. Martinez. Do you think the Tigers are going to move towards a youth movement and we're going to see that team dismantled a bit, Bill? I think they have to. I don't think they have any choice. Uh, I'd hate to see Martinez go. I, I could lose Victor Martinez with no problem at all. They're stuck with that contract. Mm. The guy can't run. Uh, nobody's going to probably take him except maybe in the first of August. Um, Kinsler, I love him, but to get something, you're going to have to give something up. And they, there's also been talk about Verlander and Miggy, but take on those contracts, that's huge. I would I would like to see them finish their career there, but they, they're going to have a good pitching staff next year. Yeah. But the rest of it, I'm not so sure yeah. about. I can't see Verlander because he just he's such an important part of that team. Yeah. Um, but uh, J.D. Martinez has become Ooh. one of my favorite yeah. ball players. Yeah. I love the way he plays, and whoever grabs him, I think they're going to get a tremendous player. Oh, no, no question. Yeah. And finally, Bill, um, tell, us the, tell us about the Blenheim Blades. Where do you think they're going to finish this year? Boy, that's a good one. You know, I mean, <laughs> if you look at the standings today, there's like five points between first and fourth, and that could all change again tonight. And we've got Amherstburg in here, or we'll have on Sunday night. We have to beat Amherstburg, Essex, and Lakeshore in our remaining games with them, I think, to finish first. But any of those top places are good. We've got a good team. Uh, we've improved with the addition of John Montgomery. I'm sure our general manager, Wayne Cowell, is still looking. We're a couple of guys away, you know. Right. Uh, but everybody else is looking, too. I, I don't think there's been much movement at the de December one deadline, but that's just one deadline, you know. Well, Bill, you know what? I, I, I've called a number of games, and I, Sean and I both have fallen in love with uh, PGHL for Junior C Hockey, and I think goaltending's a key, and I love the kid you got in Eric Stewart's, and he's Eric, pretty solid. Eric is just, a, after the terrible tragedy of a couple of years ago with the passing of his mom, who used to babysit my kids, by the way, what a sweetheart Patty was, um, and we've got a good goaltender, we've added a good defenseman, we've got scoring up front. Keir Cumming is the guy who has just really stepped up after being a 16-year-old last year, uh, as tough as nails, and uh, so as I say, we're, I think we're two guys away, maybe, from being really elite, but most of the other teams are too. Essex, I don't think, is quite what they were. Lake, Lakeshore impresses me yes. a lot, although I wouldn't tell Mark Sagan that. <laughs> <laughs> a good friend of mine. But, uh, and, and Amherstburg, like, there's not a lot to, to choose from. And watch out for Wheatley. They've been kind of coming up. There are a bunch of guys that are about 5'7", five, 5'8", five, but they're quick. Once again, after the first day of the year, it depends. The, the veteran guys, George Aiken used to have a saying, don't worry about anything until December 15th. And then if you don't start playing well right after December 15th, you're probably not going to do much. And that's probably, particularly in our league right. this year. Right. And George would say that every year. So. Interesting. Well, we love that Junior C uh, playoff format. And everybody, of course, recalls that tremendous series last year, Blenheim and Dresden, when you're just driving down the, the roads to those community barns. That's just tremendous hockey. Attendance well, was incredible. Oh, for yes. sure. Well, Bill, thank you so much for joining no, no uh, problem, Pete and Sean on CK Sports Talk. You're just a host of, of information. Um, I envy the great experiences you've had. And um, once again, thank you so so much for being with us. Oh, you're welcome. You know, growing up in Dutton, I never expected, and being the Tiger fan I was, I never expected to be able to do what I did and go where, where I did and meet who I did and, and to have breakfast at Gordy and Colleen's house. And I mean, just amazing. And it was fun. As I said, every day was fun. There was some great stories to tell, some great people that I worked with. Well, that's, that's fantastic. Wow, that was just outstanding, Mr. Moynihan. Uh, hey, listen, we got to pay some bills, and then uh, we're going to come back with some final thoughts, uh, some shout-outs, and uh, we're going to hear from Bill Cole. We'll be right back. Because local does matter. This is CK Sports Talk on 99.1 CKXS. All right, folks, welcome back. CK Sports Doc, Peter Kopp, Sean Moynihan. We're in the final segment of our show. And, and Mr. Moynihan, I got to tell you, I heard this uh, piece play. We've got uh, 99.1 now has Bill Cole. Uh, Bill's had some uh, health issues and that, but he's still uh, plugging away. And this is called Candid Cole, Personal Perspectives of an Armchair Athlete. 
And, uh, folks, you can go to ckxfm.com, and uh, you'll see it right there on the webpage, too. Oh, it's outstanding. And, uh, you know, I, I get I, – it's interesting to hear everyone get excited about the Maple Leafs, Pete, you know, but uh, that's a beautiful piece from Bill Cole. All right, let's listen. Well, Christmas is still a few weeks away. As a Maple Leaf fan, I've already received a pretty good gift. I got my hockey team back. As a long-suffering Maple Leafs fan, I, of course, stuck with them through thick and thin. Far more thin than thick. You say 1967 to any Maple Leaf fan, we cringe. We get through the Ballard years. The coaching icons like Danny Maloney and Doug Carpenter, Mike Nicoluck, and Floyd Smith. Now, sure, they teased us along the way. Big nights, Lanny McDonald's Game 7 winner against the Islanders. Nick Borshevsky that night in Detroit, or Doug Gilmore against the Blues with that double wraparound OT winner, but a lot of down days. But a couple of years ago, it took a turn for the worse. A team led by Phil Kessel and Joffrey Lupel, they became something else entirely. Unwatchable, but even worse, unlikable. But the tide has turned under Team Shanahan. They're fun to watch again and cheer for again. The kids are all right. Matthews and Marner and Nylander. Great pieces to build around. Will they win a Stanley Cup this year? No. Will they even make the playoffs? It's highly unlikely, but they are headed in the right direction. There's still room in the bandwagon but seats are going fast so thank you santa uh, now about those blue jays isn't that outstanding oh, that's great he's such a great writer yeah, seats and, are uh, going fast <laughs> isn't that the truth well that's that's great hey i gotta give a couple of shout outs here well, certainly the great bill cole good to hear him back on the air and gump i know he's the general manager over there at the oaks uh um, I know you had a nice family get together uh, yesterday, and Bill yeah. Saunders too. You know, thank you, Bill, for for making yourself available for that and very informative interview. You know, Pete, interview. Bill, just a natural sports fanatic and understands the games. And uh, good to always hear from a Tiger fan. And Pete, while we're doing some some shout outs, my good neighbor Fred Durick. I know he's doing backflips over the Detroit Lions. So hello to hello to Fred. And also, I just want to mention. Uh, to all the boys gathered at the Corstein residence for the Michigan Ohio State game, I know they're still in mourning, and I just want to give them a shout out, saying things things will right themselves. So, uh, Michigan fans, you'll be all right. Okay, well, uh, next week, tune in. We've got Rebecca Reimer as our media theme continues for the month of December, and for my colleague in arms, the Wizard from Wallaceburg, Mr. Sean Patrick Moynihan. For our producer, you got him. Just over my shoulder, Mr. Corey North, who always heads south to Ridgetown, that is. My name is Peter Cobb saying so long. Thanks for listening to CK Sports Talk. Tonight's show is brought to you by Canada Business Services, the Chatham Kent Sports Network, and 991 CKXS. For more local sports news and information, log on to the Chatham Kent Sports Network at CKSN.ca.